all for being here. Um, not even two years ago, there was a day when I found myself running into the Pacific Ocean outside San Francisco, finally finishing walking across the United States. I began about 4,000 miles east and 11 months before that. And in the time I spent on the road, I experienced this thing I'm going to call connection in a way I'd never known it before. Um, and I think uh, there's this relationship between connection and story in that connection, I think, is sort of the whole point of storytelling. You know, you take your unimaginably complex life and distill it down into this simple little story thing that you can then communicate into someone else um, and use to connect. And while I was walking, um, I got these hyper-concentrated daily doses of connection. And it was especially with people, but often with myself and the land I was passing through. And it was some mix of awe and gratitude and grief at the inevitable goodbye and love at its most powerful. Um, and in the time since I've finished walking, I've spent a lot of time and energy trying to figure out just how this happened. You know, what catalyzed this remarkable kind of connection. Um, and it's important to me to figure this out because I want that again. But I don't necessarily want to walk across America again. You know, it's, it's exhausting. Um, and so that's what I'm here to talk to you about. You know, what is the magic formula? What are the secret ingredients to connecting like this in the real world? Um, as I go, I'm going to be showing photographs of some of the people I met along the way. Um, and they're in no particular order. Uh, they're meant to overwhelm you, um, just like I was overwhelmed by the sheer magnitude of people out there who will stop on the side of the road to connect, um, to say hello, or even to take you in to their homes. Um, and then you find yourself sitting there on the couch next to Marion Furman in Alabama talking about what it's like to be the mother of 10 children, you know, or on the couch next to James Paisano on Navajo Reservation talking about what it's like to lose your life partner. And you find yourself caring for these people in a way that doesn't make sense. Um, it's disproportionate to the amount of time you spent with them. But there it is nonetheless. Um, and these photographs are meant to sort of stir the beginnings of those feelings for you. Every one of them has a story. Um, as I walked, I wore a sign on my backpack that said, walking to listen. And those two words, I think, are instructive in this exploration of connection and story. Um, they became teachers for me as I was crossing the continent. And when I think of this idea of listening, one story in particular comes to mind. And this was outside New Orleans. Um, and people warned me about walking through the city, and I was nervous about it. Uh, and on the outskirts of town, as the sun was setting, a guy calls out to me from the side of the road on his porch. I cross the road to get to him, and he asks what I'm doing. I explain it. And he goes, oh, so you're from Pennsylvania, so you're a damn Yankee. <laughs> and I'd heard it before at that point, and I thought it was a joke, so I kind of laughed. And he goes, well, that's neutral ground you're standing on right there, but as soon as you come onto my lawn, that's my territory. So at this point, I'm thinking, all right, this is what people were warning me about. You know, I got to get the hell out of here. So I turn to leave, and then he shouts, hey, hey, wait, do you like beer? And I do like beer. <laughs> and so I said, yeah, I do. And he goes, do you want one? So I'll be the first to admit, I can be kind of naive sometimes. You know, I'm just sort of generally clueless. But never to the extent that I wouldn't understand the possible risk of saying yes to something like this. But I couldn't say no. And I found myself in a position to, to accept this guy's invitation. So we went into his house. And in that moment, everything changed. Because before, I was the vulnerable one. But now he was too. You know, we were in his home, and there were cat toys lying everywhere. And he went from being this one-dimensional crazy man to being a guy who lives alone with his cat. You know, he was, it was this humanizing moment. And that continued at the table. We had our beers, and he told me a story that I don't even remember, but he included a detail I'll never forget. He goes, uh, I was really pissed off that day because I had to bury my son. And then he continued on as if he didn't say anything, you know. And I realized that before, my view of this man was this pinprick little view. And with that single detail, he expanded before me. And I couldn't help but feel something like compassion for the guy. You know, It didn't justify his aggression, but it explained a lot of it. Maybe that's what he saw when he saw me walking by. Maybe he saw his dead son. You know? And so there's this idea that listening is the growing of empathy. You know, and it almost can't help but undercut the assumptions we inevitably make about each other. Um, so, we finished our beers, and I realized I hadn't gotten the guy's name. And so as I was leaving, I said, thank you so much for the beer. What's your name, man? Uh, he sort of looked at me for a second, and he goes, Bond. 
James Bond, <laughs> which I thought was perfect. I could not make that up. Um, there's also this idea that listening is to delight in somebody, to celebrate them. Um, it's nothing new or revolutionary, but when I got it, when I got this idea, it did revolutionize how I approach people. Um, I'm going to play a quick clip. It's uh, Jesse Moden in southern Alabama talking about raccoon hunting at night. So the idea is simple, you know, you peel back certain layers of yourself, they peel back certain layers, and then you gain access to this beloved experience, um, to a part of their being that they consider precious. You know, how can you not delight in that? I love listening to Jesse talk because you can hear his love, you know, I mean, I, you, you can hear how alive he was in the living of that experience and then even now in the retelling of it. And I think the mutual celebration that results uh, is a huge part of this connection I'm trying to get back to. Um, there's also this thought that listening is learning. Again, nothing new, but when I really embrace this type of listening and being, it, it changed who I am. Um, I'm going to play another clip. Uh, this is Otho Rogers, an old cowboy preacher out in New Mexico, and he's talking about aging. It had been, I don't know, over yesterday or something, I was in my 20s. You know, it just, it just goes by. Whenever you're young and you're waiting to get 16 to get your driver's license, the years go by kind of how it goes. And then you get that, you get out and you go to work and all that stuff. Then they get a little faster to get like fence posts. And then pretty soon you get up 65 years old and things change in your life so much, so drastically. I'm pushing the feet where you want them and your body where it used to be. It's, it's gone. And, and time goes by. Like I love that moment. He just nails that metaphor. Um, and in this sense, listening is to take solace in the solidarity inherent in the people around you. You know, it's to remember that when something hard does happen, you don't have to reinvent the wheel to figure out how to get through it. Um, everyone around you is this unique wellspring of guidance, and all you have to do is ask. Um, it's sort of this preparation. There was another moment with a different old man in Alabama um, and he was talking about what it was like to lose his parents, and then his siblings, and then now his friends, to dementia and death. And he then flipped the interview on me, and he goes, you'll know what it's like. You have lots of grieving to do. <sighs> he just like leveled that, boom, you know? It freaked me out. Because when you stop to really think about it, it's true, and that's terrifying. But I appreciated that he said this because it raised the stakes of our conversation. You know, all of a sudden the stakes were as high as life and death itself. You know, and if I asked the right questions, if I listened the right way, I stood to gain something really important, you know, uh, to prepare for whatever's coming down the road. Because it is, you know. Um, and when you're connecting with someone like that, when you're listening in that way or sharing stories in that way, uh, you almost can't help but recognize the moment you have together as this precious, and tragically fleeting kernel in time and space. Because that's what it is, but you can see it. And those connect connections go deep quickly, uh, and you don't forget them. Um, I'll never forget Bill Guy or Otho Rogers. Um, so there's listening and then there's walking, and I think that's another critical piece to this puzzle of connection. Um, first and foremost, because it literally connects you to the earth. You know, you feel the ground beneath your feet, and you feel the heat, or the cold, or the rain, or the wind. It's always headwinds. It's never tailwinds. I don't know how that works. But, um, 
And so there's this conversation happening between you and your environment, but also between you and your insides, you know, whoever it is you happen to be at that moment, because it's slow and it's quiet. Um, and then you're feeling your feet and they're screaming at you, you know, and your legs hurt and they're chafing and you're dirty and sweaty and you're made to do it. You know, we're made to walk. And I think when we do, we gain access to a particular kind of connection that just isn't accessible in any other way. Um, everything is simplified. Uh, so many of the distractions slip away. Um, and it's like you're in this white and quiet blank space. And so the slightest bit of color, you see it just by contrast. And the slightest sound, you notice that too. And these things affect you in a strange way. You know, I would notice the smallest little strand of spider silk floating by, um, or a smattering of tar on the road that looked like a smiley face. You know, and I'd, I'd appreciate those things. Um, and those were little things. I mean, when someone pulled over on the side of the road to give me a cold Gatorade on a hot day, it made me want to walk forever. You know, it, uh, it transformed my day into this miracle. And I think what I'm getting at here is this idea of radical gratitude. Um, and that may be the bedrock of this connection uh, I'm talking about and trying to get back to now that I'm not walking anymore. Um, and I do think that radical gratitude is often missing from the definition of connection in a more mainstream sense. You know, in, in that sense, it often refers to ambition or career. You know, he's very well connected. She has lots of connections. Or to our online uh, social media network and the connections there, which are important, no doubt, but tend to lack, I think, this gratitude that uh, it's, not, it's not inevitable with these face-to-face -face interactions and connections, but I think it's much more accessible. Um, so I think one story that really illustrates this idea of radical gratitude it happened in the panhandle of Texas. Um, and at that point, I realized that there are all different kinds of walking. You know, um, there's hurt walking, there's high walking, dream walking, fear walking, it, it all depends on your mood and the weather. Um, and my favorite was weep walking. Um, it was sort of the culmination of this gratitude and of this connection. And basically it was, you know, you're feeling more than you can really take and you become this sobbing mess on the side of the road. Or I do, you know, that was me. Um, <laughs> and it's a little strange talking about it here because it only happened when I was alone and it happened outside of the realm of words. And so here I am in front of a bunch of people talking about it, and it's a little bit contradictory. But it is important, because I think it was the manifestation of this connection and the gratitude. Um, so Texas Panhandle, hot as hell, uh, this trucker pulls over. Um, and he said he'd, he'd seen me for a few days because I was walking his trucking route. Um, and when I told him what I was doing, he gave me two cold Gatorades and a sleeve of popcorn. And he said he was going to take care of me for the next couple days, because I was still going to be on his route. Um, and he did. He, he stopped at several gas stations before I could get there and told them that I was coming and that I could have whatever I wanted. Um, it was on him. And the last time I saw Mel, his name was Mel Jack, um, it was outside Lubbock. He pulled over and got out and gave me this water cooler. Um, and he said, I know you have the hottest part of your journey coming up, and I want you to have a cold drink whenever you need it. And then we said goodbye, and he left. And I weep walked. Because I was alone in that moment, but I felt totally supported and recognized. Um, and I felt belonging. And I think that's what this connection's all about, you know? I think, uh, and I think walking and the openness the openness involved in that and the vulnerability involved in that sort of made this possible, was one of the things that made it possible. Um, so after 4,000 miles or so and 11 months of walking, I finally made it to the Pacific Ocean, dove in, felt really good about myself, you know, felt like I'd learned a lot. The only problem is, is I forget every day. You know, all these things I'm sharing with you now, I forget. Um, and so that's the challenge, you know, how, how to remember that I'm walking, um, how, to, how to catalyze and activate this connection that I, I do believe is latent underneath everything and just waiting to be accessed, um, how, how to recognize that you're walking across America. Um, I think it happens with conversations like the ones we're having this weekend, and I think it happens with a lot of walking and listening and everything that goes along with those practices. 
And I think like walking from the Atlantic coast to the Pacific, it happens one step at a time. Thank you.